I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right, we had that good countdown going I on like there. Yeah, back in the house. Yeah, that was so good. Grief. This has been uh, we we we've been talking about a lot of stuff before the the, uh, the microphones got turned on, but we've got Dr. Michael Chamberlain here. L- Lanny, we we love talking about. I love these talking turkeys. about turkeys. There's no question it, about it. What we can do to make it better. Yeah, D- Dudley. There's so much going on. There's so many. You've got questions. We yeah. all have a lot of questions, and we've been talking about it since last night. You know, like you said, whether we're mic'd up or not, we just every, everybody's curious and wants to learn more. Yep, they sure are. And nobody's more curious than uh, than our boss there at the end of the table that just walked in. Doxy, yes. hey, oh, yes. he's very, he's a very <laughs> curious guy. So, look, we've uh, Mike, we, we appreciate you being here. Sure. And, and what you do, the the you're the tip of the broadhead, as Lanny likes to say, the tip of the spear out there. Mm-hmm. You're probably not making a lot of friends at some <laughs> in, in some circles, but you're putting you out the, in West the, the, the truth. Uh, <laughs> I mean, social media is rough. I mean, you post oh something, there's always going to be somebody kind of taking a shot at you. But we say. appreciate what you're doing out there. Uh, with all this research and and, and, and gosh, our, our that we just love this turkey so much. We just we're sick about what's happening in some places. Mm-hmm. So, Me too. Yeah, Me too. I can take the social media criticism. <laughs> That's I know right. That my heart's in the right place. Yep. And, and I don't say things that I don't have data to support. And if I do, I say I, I don't have I'm data to support. But, if you're, wrong, <laughs> but if you're wrong, you're also quick to say, eh. yeah. Well, that's part um, of being a scientist. If you can't admit you're wrong, you need to go into a different career. <laughs> we were talking about this before we mic'd up, but uh, I noticed in the past that it seems like a lot of professors were muted, uh, almost like they were scared to, mm-hmm. to discuss things with the public that's important. Um, and that's something I am not seeing from you and, and some of these new guys coming along is that they're really here to make a difference. And if, if you've got to ruffle a couple of feathers or speak your mind about some things, uh, you guys are doing it. And I, I think that's very important for the future. I agree. And, I mean, you know, the bottom line is when you say something, you open yourself up to criticism. Yep. And we don't – we as people don't like being criticized in general, and we don't like confrontation or engagement that makes us uncomfortable. And – like I've told you off the air, Dudley, you'll you'll be hard pressed to find somebody that could not care less like I do. You know, I, I don't mind being criticized, and I don't mind difficult conversations, and I don't mind awkward situations where I'm interacting with somebody that disagrees with me. That's that's part of life, um, and I think if more of us, this is my opinion, and I'm obviously biased. I think if more of us were willing to engage in conversations, mm-hmm. recognizing that we don't have to always agree with each right. other, that but we all want the same thing. We all want more birds on the landscape. We all have different perspectives, and those perspectives are important. We just have to be willing to be broad enough and, and open-minded enough to recognize that. Right. If it takes criticism, then it takes criticism. You know? I just we got to be careful about personal agendas. That's such a poison. And it's so I mean, hard as yeah, people, you because, know, I mean, we all have right. our agendas, you know, in life, you know, whether it's your personal life or whatever. I mean, we all have goals. We yes, all have- but yours are so steeped in. No one's, look, we're all human. We all have huge flaws, but his are so steeped in the truth. I mean, you're, you're after the truth and he takes a position based on, cause you know, exhaustive lifestyle career at searching for the truth. That's what research is. Then, you know, you're not scared to take that position based on right. the truth. And all I was getting at is, like, if people would – I mean, maybe you, maybe you should come into it with an agenda. But make your agenda the truth, you know. Well, don't act like it's the truth that it's just your opinion. Base it on what we've got documented, what people have researched and found to be true. Base it on what you've actually found out by example on your own place, you know. I think Laney took some exception 
when you said that none of us are perfect. Look, you see what we work with. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. <laughs> so you're based out of the University of Georgia there in Athens, and are, are, you've got projects all over the country, don't you? Could, sure. could you explain a little bit about what all you've got going on? It's yeah, crazy. so I, I work with a, a number of collaborators in other states, and – some of the work is mine that I direct, whether it's in South Carolina or Georgia. Uh, I have some work in Alabama that, that I direct. Um, or it could be studies where I'm collaborating uh, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Nebraska, Texas, Louisiana. I mean, other places that I have colleagues that have a mutual interest and we share information. And that's a powerful thing because academics – historically don't like to share anything and i really see the collaborative nature of what what i do as being really positive now and the folks that i work with have the same mindset we all recognize that there, it's more powerful to have a thousand data points than a hundred yes and it's more powerful to have data stretching the entire subspecies range than just one mm -hmm. study site so yes, I have a lot going on, but it's it's not. I don't want to take credit for it. Right. A lot of other people are involved, and a lot of really talented people are involved that are doing the same type of work that I do. So and, we call that replication, correct? Yes. Uh, yes. So me as a hunter, I'm making observations when I'm out in the woods, uh, and I can form an opinion. But the difference between what I see and what you see is. Uh, you're seeing stuff all over the place. You know, uh -huh. things are getting replicated, uh -huh. and then you're doing the math and, and averaging things. Uh -huh. um, and so it's very important to have folks like you around doing these replicated studies. Uh, yeah, that replication brings power. You know, we, we as scientists certainly. become more confident in our yeah. inferences, in our statements, with more replication. As pattern, as you replicate, if the pattern is, is, is a real pattern, it will be become apparent and it will become more apparent and more pronounced with replication or it becomes noisier and, and you realize that, oh gosh, we're in trouble. <laughs> you know, we didn't get the answer w that we thought we'd get, right. which sometimes is frankly is better than getting the answer you anticipated. But yes, replication is key. And, and I see a lot of collaboration in the turkey research world now to the point where you know, yesterday driving over here, I was on a conference call with researchers from all over the eastern United States about sharing egg samples uh, for some testing at the University of Tennessee. And and I don't think I would have seen that five years ago. You know, last week I was on a conference call with researchers and agencies from all over Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, Maryland, Missouri, me, everywhere, sharing data. Mm -hmm. sharing information, collecting data the same so that it's standardized, so that we can all benefit from it. So when, you know, Laney walks into his commissioner at a state agency level, he's got five times the amount of data across five states than he had if he had just done it in, a, in the vacuum of his own state. Mm -hmm. And because the patterns we're seeing are so uniform across states, we're seeing the same issues, it makes sense that we would collaborate with each other and be more engaging as academics than we've been historically. So if, if uh, help me understand how a state makes changes. <clears throat> so, for instance, if a state wanted to go to reduce their, 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 their bag limit mm -hmm. by a bird or two, mm -hmm. is that a recommendation that the biologists make and then the, the and that it's just taken, mm -hmm. or didn't, then is it is it turned over into a politician's hands, and mm -hmm. that would ha be a problem. a wall, a pro problem. problem? Yeah. So I'm glad you Still asked me that, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. I'm allergic all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. to he said the p word. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell the audience this was not a staged question, but I'm glad you asked it because I want to say this, and and I'll I hope a lot of people hear this. I don't set regulations in states. I don't recommend bag limits. I don't recommend season frameworks, and they don't ask me. I've never been asked to mm. recommend a season framework, ever. That's not my job. So what the, the way regulations are set is the agency will either collect information or not 
um, addressing a concern. So I'll give you an example using Georgia. This is what happened in Georgia this past year. After years of declining production, the agency watched harvest decline and decided they wanted to make a change. They had been seeing the data coming from the work in their own state and it caused them concern to the point where they tried to identify things they could change that presumably could have some impact on the population. They decided to reduce the bag limit and to change the season dates, basically shorten the season a little bit, move the opening date back later. Why did they do that? They did that because the science suggests that that's the more conservative season framework for wild turkeys, which we've known since the 1990s. That's one example. In other examples, um, you may have a, you know, a commission, a group of commissioners that votes on a regulations package. Typically, it comes from the biological staff or from the wildlife division in a state where they recommend a change, and then it's either adopted or not. But as y'all all know, you know, social pressures and politics can derail biology mm. every single time, yep. which is why, quite frankly, and people don't like to hear this, but it's the truth. The season regulations that many of us have grown up enjoying in the South were never based on biology of wild turkeys, ever. They were based on social pressures, politics, and our desire to hunt the bird when we wanted to hunt it, not when it made sense biologically to do it. And when people hear that, they say, you're full of crap. And I'm... I can direct you to resources that were published in the 1980s and 90s that told us exactly how to frame a turkey season biologically. Mm -hmm. And we ignored it. Agencies in the South largely ignored it. And they did that because turkey populations were exploding. Times right. were great. Right. And there weren't Everything many hunters. Were good. Yeah, hunters were lower. And the landscape has changed. And we're no longer in that. We're in the new normal where the regulations that we've used historically, first of all, that never made sense. But second of all, the science has shown forever that they were potentially Not misguided. Well, right. um, and when you tell people that, they get really upset. And I, and I understand that. I deal with this a lot with younger hunters, say 20-ish, 25-year-olds, that will contact me on social media or something and get really upset that, I would say such a thing, and I send them a document that is widely considered the seminal document on harvest regulations for turkeys, and I tell them, go to page this, this, and this, and read it, and what you'll see is that the authors of that, who are were renowned turkey researchers, told us that you need to time the season at the peaks and in nest incubation, meaning when most hens were, were already nesting, you need to remove 30% or less of your toms. Mm. And you need to do that because if you don't, you're going to disrupt breeding. And if you disrupt breeding by either starting too early or killing too many, you're going to eventually see declines in reproduction. And those recommendations were made based on data collected in the 1980s. And those data sets, in those data sets, production was more than twice what we're seeing in the South. Hmm. In other words, the juvenile hen to adult ratio in the fall was three to one, meaning for every adult you saw, wow. there were three young. We see 0.3 in the South. Think about that. Three to one versus 0.3 to one. That's exponential. We're yeah. just not making the birds, yet we're still under this, this mindset that that percentage of toms is – is is okay and it will be long term and I, it's not just me there's a lot of people working on this now trying to figure out what is the number what's the right number and the, the bottom line like we talked about last night at dinner is it's probably so variable across the landscape right we'll never understand it no so we're going to have to to get to a point where we're willing to accept which toxie says all the time what is sustainable what yeah. What can we take without taking too much? What can we take leaving it as good or yeah. better?
Hey, this is Dudley from Native Nurseries. I spend a lot of time deep in the woods looking for special trees. Onyx keeps me on track and helps me be sure I can find them again and my way out. Try it out for yourself and see. Use coupon code MOSSYOAK to save 20% on your Onyx subscriptions. So what's so bad about... <clears throat> We cut back on the harvest, and maybe we cut back a little more than we needed to. I mean, we've been over harvesting for a long, long time, or harvesting at wrong at the wrong time of the, the year, or time. you know, whatever. Even techniques might be a uh, an issue with stuff. But all I'm saying is, so if we cut back a little too much, we gave up our own selfish needs a little too much, and the net result was more abundant turkeys. Is that so bad? I mean, shouldn't we always try to be conservative? I think we do. And this one intended to be another sermon, but it's just <laughs> everywhere there's going. He, he spoke to that because it's like, you know, politics gets in the way. And I know that's just a big, broad term, and it's kind of negative to people today about, you know, politics being, you know, it's becoming popular and getting revoted in your office and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, clearly politics should be the servant to biology and to our resource, mm -hmm. the turkey, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be making demands of our politicians to revote them in when they give us more liberal harvest and seasons. Now, I can see where I would rather them cut back on, honestly, I'd rather them cut back on my duck numbers. I'd rather them cut back on my turkey numbers and give me a longer season as long as everybody adheres to these things. Because I can get out and enjoy it more. Mm -hmm. I could take someone else and worry about shooting one myself, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would rather have more time out there if it meant cutting back. I do, personally, that's me. But, again, in general, I think we should look at all the politicians and all the people setting these regulations. Like, Are they doing what's best for the resource, not are they doing what's best for me right. to shoot stuff? And I think we should start electing people based on that. And I know it's hard to get to that, and that's micromanaging everybody's you know elected officials and so forth but in in general mm -hmm. our populist view should be based on what's best for our resource that we love mm -hmm. not our own selfish wants yeah that's the, all i'm the getting agencies at. are in a tricky position because opportunity kills ducks and turkeys yeah. in other words if you cut time you save birds <clears throat> if you reduce bag limits you can save some birds, but not proportionally as much. That's right. So you got to give up. There's a there's a take and give. Yeah, with turkeys, you see that most of the birds are killed the first two weeks of the season, and agencies know that. So if you open a season April first, you're gonna most of your toms that are going to die are dead by April fifteenth. If you open it on April fifth, it's April twentieth. I mean, the bottom line is we shoot most of our birds early whenever the season opens. Right. Yeah, because the ones yeah. easiest to harvest are gone, sure. you know, exactly. much less. We take the, the birds issues. that are that are willing to play the game, and by two weeks into the game, gobbling activity is declining, birds are wisening up, we're killing some of the vocal aggressive ones, and things change. And that's the way it's, it's always worked with turkeys. So all this research that you've done, is there any correlation between hunting pressure and gobbling? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And on heavily hunted sites, you see this very clear signature. It doesn't matter when hunting starts. If it's, let's just say it starts March 20th or March 25th or April 1st or April 10th or whatever. As soon as hunting starts, gobbling declines. Um, it takes about a week of a lag. In other words, the season gets going. You see gobbling kind of trail off and then it, it drops. Um, in prior to that, it's ramping up, as it should be. It's ramping up, ramping up, competition's increasing, there's laying going on, they're breeding, they're aggressive, they're talking to each other, boom. And then we start hunting, and they change their behavior. And it's not that we're killing all of the vocal toms. Some of them are just gobbling less, right? right. Um, what you see on non-hunted sites is a bell curve. It's a perfect bell curve. Huh. Um, gobbling ramps up in in early March, peaks in mid-April, and starts to slowly tail off where there's just as much gobbling in May as there was in March. And that mm -hmm. makes sense because there's still a lot of competition later in the nesting season because some hens are, are breeding again, and they're re-nesting, and they're going back, 
you know, to these toms and they're receptive. So, and then to your, to your question, Bobby, on some of these sites we've had that are only like hunted in pulses, like two days and then no hunting for four or five days and two days. What do you think? What do you think happens? Gobbling increases, the hunt starts, it decreases. There's no hunting for four or five days. It increases. They start hunting it decreases. And I mean, it's, it's very clear this bird behaves according to activity that we place in front yeah, of it. Pressure. Yeah, That's right. for sure. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. People like Lanny. Yeah, you got to put going down the dummy line so much. That's <laughs> what it comes down to. So, <laughs> what about so so going back to the to the state agencies? Is it hard for them to kind of turn the barge if if they started realizing? Let's just use Tennessee as an example. I don't mm-hmm. know anybody in Tennessee, but if they wanted to adjust, does it take them years to adjust, or can they do it within a year? The most of these states are working on regulation cycles, so. You know, every so often they, a new reg cycle comes up. So they typically will make recommendations for changes a year or two in advance. So, you know, for instance, in Georgia, I was in, you know, I was, I was providing data to the state agency. And I know because I was talking to their biologists periodically, you know, they were discussing regulations changes years ago. It just was implemented this past year. Yeah. Um, so most of these agencies are, they're having to go through this process in advance for something that's going to happen two years or a year down the road. But, but yes, they can, they can make changes in a fairly timely manner. But as you know, when you start making changes to regulations, people get really mad. It just (laughs) feels like a lot of States have some antiquated laws. Uh, I mean, I think about the bearded hens. We, we've kind (laughs) of lightly discussed that. Mm. Why, Why is anybody shooting a bearded hen? It, there is okay. I'm, I'm gonna get attacked by some <laughs> agencies here, but there is no biological justification for shooting a bearded hen. No, I don't know. I suspect that that was a relic regulation mm-hmm. that was put in place <clears throat> when someone thought we were too stupid to tell the difference between a tom and a hen that is half his size, but he's but she's got a beard. I don't know that. That's just my suspicion, but. This is one of the more interesting questions I get on social media is can bearded hens nest and brood? And the answer is yes. The beard emerges from a papilla. Every turkey has it. Every bird has it. It's just that some hens express it. They are biologically just like every other hen. So shooting one because you think it's inferior is nonsense. Shooting one because... um, you're thinking, that okay, well, the state allows it. Well, that's your own decision, but just understand there's no biological justification for killing one, just like there's no justification for killing. It's common. I mean, I don't. I can't think of a place we go that we have yeah, or lease or in, that I hadn't seen bearded hens. I we see, see them about all 10, the time. About 10% of yeah, our captured birds. that's a lot of our, our That's bearded. a high percentage. Hmm, it's interesting. And some, I saw somebody yeah. sent me a video from California of a flock of I think it was 25 hens in a group, and 22 of them were bearded. Yeah, like, probably genetic. Pretty crazy, yeah, area. for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. and I, it, I'm not throwing, I mean, it's probably happened to a lot of people. You're hunting a turkey, goblin, whatever, you know, and then all of a sudden something pops out with a beard, and you just didn't pay enough attention. You know, it happens. So, but we shouldn't, in my opinion, shouldn't make it okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would eliminate so much of that if it just made it illegal and someone makes an honest mistake. They just can deal with it however they want to deal with it. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, sh- you know, whatever. I mean, I'm not faulting them. It I happens. I think it's just a curious regulation. That yeah, I, it is. I, I if there's no, it's what, just a relic. Yeah, I, think I mean, I'll, there shouldn't yeah. be a regulation that we have that someone can have a, ask a really simple, non-intrusive, you know, questions like why. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, they should be able to explain why, yeah. you know. Well, if the state can ask you to, you know, take a ruler out to the woods so you can measure the width of the deer's antlers yeah. or its age before, you know, you can shoot it. Or identify Certainly you can wing. tell the mm-hmm. difference between a brown and a black bird mm-hmm. in the woods. Yeah. Or, yeah, a, the head is the dead giveaway. Yeah, sure. A yeah. teeny little skinny neck with no red on it, you know. I'll, I'll get asked sometimes, too, well, what difference does it make? Like, so what if a – what if it's a, a small a, number? Yeah. What if a state kills two or three hundred bearded hens? Whoopee! 
And I think to myself, well, you know, it didn't help, right? right? It, didn't, no. it didn't help the population by killing those 300 hens. Did it hurt? Well, I don't know. I'm, sure it hurt. I can answer that. Sure, but it did. sure didn't help. That's kind of the way I look at it. Maybe not point, on a huge scale, but to that particular area, certainly it makes a well, difference. Well, I mean, if that was the case, then, hey, I, I decided to kill a few extra over the limit. What did it hurt? Well, I mean, just like any other, if it's a statewide law, if you look at that, it's like the whole state could possibly do that. And, you know, as a whole state, did we kill a couple hundred extra hens? We, that's a big deal. Could so, be. yeah. Yeah. It's a big deal. So, Taxi, I, I don't want to position a soapbox for you because you, Lord knows you <laughs> don't on need it one. I'm already, But, so. but you, you, at, from time to time, you make a comment about why can't we have stronger laws when people violate a wildlife yeah, law? Yeah, I just I, I feel like it makes it, a lot of sense. Well, Could I you just, go through that real yeah, quick? Yeah, I don't want to. And I just, in general, it would seem like we would just, it's not emotion, it's just logic. And, you know, that's the great thing about research. You're just trying to feed logic and truth. So what what is the most critical factor in going and hunting and game species to their success, their survival, their health, their, you know, creating an abundance of wildlife, uh, you know, ensuring they're around for hundreds and hundreds of years, all those things, uh, long-term sustainability, that's a big term in everything today. And mirror our laws and the restrictions and the, the consequences of not following those. So I'm just saying if the biggest issue is harvest numbers, shouldn't the biggest fine and penalty be over harvest? That's all I'm saying is just not an emotional soapbox thing, but it just seems like when you have a state where the most critical thing is our numbers that we harvest, yet it's almost maybe just a slap on the wrist to, for that law. I mean, we've got some laws that are so prohibitive and penalizing and, you know, con you know confiscating uh -huh. things and whatever. And that's all fine. I'm just saying that. It seems like you should have the that should mirror what's most detrimental to our population, and let the laws mirror that. Is all I'm kind of saying. So yeah, so. And I've uh, heard you say that like it should be. It seems like to me, and I may be wrong. I stand corrected. So this isn't a soapbox thing. I'm just throwing it out there. It just seems like the biggest fine should be killing too many. So Mike, so his thought was, if I understood it correctly, why don't we, why wouldn't we make that violation super painful for somebody? Mm -hmm. yeah. Say say a five thousand mm -hmm. dollar fine, mm -hmm. and then his his point of justifying it was the only people that are going to fuss about that want to be able to get it. by with it. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's I, right. Oh, and you know we had the, these uh, the game wardens in here uh, this past summer who d we talked about uh, the, this uh, rent turkey ring they mm -hmm. they I busted up, it, yeah. and a number of the people that they caught said it was cheaper for them to pay a fine than it was to join a club. Sure. Yeah. So we've got to reverse that somehow. Yeah. It's cheaper. It it makes more sense to someone to go pay a fine, break a law. And go pay a fine than it does to do what's right. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, even sadder crazy. to me is they they find, and I know it's false, and I know they'll day of reckoning is coming for all of them, but they find such joy in doing it, mm -hmm. which is so to me it's just sad. I'm not even judging those people because that's not my place, but I'm just I feel sad for them, and I hope they can find some greater joy in actually helping boost or grow or make more healthy a uh, species or a population, you know, as opposed to yeah. some kind of joy. It's just kind of sad. It's almost, I'll be honest with you, it's almost demonic I, I have to see trouble. that in people that take such great joy in killing way, way too many in these birds. Good gosh. I, I have trouble with people even joking around, like on social media. Like they may not be a fence hopper per se, but they joke about it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I don't know. I, I respect the bird too much. I, I like to have fun and cut up, but that's not really something I'm going to be joking about. Yeah. Lady, Personally. you got a comment? Uh, just an observation. You know, <clears throat> we're, um, as a as a outdoor people, I'd say the majority of, I don't know the majority of us, but we have pretty conservative views on a lot of things. And conservative, you know, it means less government, you know, 
less regulation. But I'd like for us to look at this as like, hey, the state agencies don't necessarily know what's going on on your place. So as much pride as you take, you know, is I guess not doing what the government says, maybe, you know, use your own determination to figure out what the regulations are. I mean, not over harvest, obviously, but under harvest, you know? So yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know where I was trying to go with that, but there seems to be some kind of commonality. No, that's an that, excellent point. You know, between that we're, we're independent people and we pride ourselves. I mean, when, I mean, maybe I'll get in trouble for this, but when do you trust what the government tells you to do? Yeah. Well, so, so Lanny, <laughs> stock so, market tells me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So. Yeah, so the state is a big area. Yeah, and to yeah, say, yeah. you yeah, know, all this put, research is localized. Yeah, that's, right. that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. So I, th- their only choice is to put these broad regulations across this area based on their, for one sure. thing. It's all they can do. All, yeah, all they right. can do. But we, again, going back to the point, we have to take uh, the responsibility in our own hands. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mike, I've got a question about, you know, we, we talk about, uh, folks, the, the possibility of lowering the bag limit or shortening the season dates. Um, one thing we did uh, at my duck camp many years ago was we set a personal time when you have to be back to the clubhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to say that was about 1030 in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also cut a few days of the week out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're creating less disturbance. Uh, we also set a rule where we're not allowed to joy ride in our boats mm-hmm. and get ducks up. We used to call it scouting, but uh, we Riding. quit doing that as well. <laughs> um, so back to my question, uh, you don't hear a, a lot about the possibility of, of shortening the, the time you can hunt. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some states you have to quit at 12. Um, do you, has there been any studies on that, you know, like taking out that opportunity to roost hunt, mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe closing the, the, the quitting time to 30 minutes before sunset instead of closing it at sunset mm-hmm. or have you heard anything or are there any some, studies some about that? Some agencies are collecting data, quantifying what percentage of the birds that are harvested are shot in, you know, in the afternoon versus the morning. And there is a significant percentage of birds that are killed in the afternoon, significant being more than, say, 10%. I mean, there's a lot of turkeys that are harvested in the afternoon. Yeah, no doubt about it. You know, on the flip side, you know, I grew up in Virginia and, and you had to stop at noon and, you know, there's – some states that have those rules are fighting against them because, you know, we all, we want to be in the woods. We want to be in the woods chasing oh, birds. Oh, yes. for sure. Yes. Um, and it's funny, you, what you just said about your duck club is exactly what we do at mine. You have to get out of the blind at 10 o'clock. You can only hunt the weekend and one day during the week. You can't joy ride. You can't go into any of the impoundments. Um, we don't even – we try not to even deer hunt in a mm-hmm. way – on stands that are the around the, the moist soil impoundments because we don't even want birds seeing us climbing up yep. know, in stands. And <laughs> one of the recommendations <laughs> that that is being made in a manuscript that we are publishing now, one of my PhD students, he found a very clear link. As you, I mean, this is a no brainer, but from public access, if you if you map access areas and how we get in the woods versus gobbling activity. You see this very clear trend. You, hmm. know, you get away from the roads and you get away from access, and you see these, you know, clear increases in gobbling activity. And it begs the question: Well, could agencies use some of that information to do what you just said? Could we create some sanctuary areas? Yeah. You know, on some of our state lands or even on our mm-hmm. private lands, where you know, I do this deer hunting on in a place I hunt in Georgia. I don't step foot in some places except to shed hunt or retrieve a deer. I don't go in there at all. You know, they're dense bedding security areas and I just don't go in there. And, you know, could we do that with turkeys? Mm -hmm. The Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks did this. They may still do it now at Tallahalla. They did it for years when I was a graduate student there. They gated off roads, you know, and made you walk. Oh yeah. You know, and so I I used to carry, you know, carry a, a mountain bike and hop on my mountain bike and drive to the end of the road. But, I had to want to get back there, yeah, you know, that's and right. and there were turkeys back at where I hunted all the time, and I'm sure there still, you know, still are. I know there's some agencies that are that are thinking about that, particularly on public lands where the pressure is so high, and the hunter satisfaction is clearly declining, and we're, you know, we, me, you, we're upset, we're frustrated, mm-hmm. we want to see some changes, we want things to improve, 
well, limiting access could be a way. You know, sanctuary areas, these places where birds can escape the pressure, if you will, you know, that's a possibility for sure. Hmm. I think it's particularly on small public lands. I think that's something of, that agencies are going to look at in addition to quotas and other ways to limit demand because I think there's a supply and demand issue with this bird. A hundred percent. I mean, from a personal standpoint, uh, I would almost rather see something like that where they cut it off at 3 p.m. You know, I can still take my gun back to the, you know, unload, put it in the case, maybe do a little bit of scouting. Uh, but uh, Or go catch some crappie. Yeah. Or go catch <laughs> some crappie. Else. Yeah. That's right. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mike, there's so many topics going on, so much being discussed. Is is there anything that's on your heart or anything that you want to make sure that gets communicated to any, anybody listening to this? I want to make sure we give you that platform and that opportunity. Yeah. I think I think one thing that I, I have seen this year, um, I saw it last year, I saw it during the COVID spring of 2020, that – I had not seen as much of previously was division. Um, mm. Division, turkey hunters fighting with yep. each other and mm. criticizing each other for, for the way they hunt, the way they don't hunt, the way they – whatever. I mean, you pick something, and and none of that does anything for the resource no. that's positive. And I, I was asked this on a podcast the other day, about this division, this divisiveness that seems to be so pervasive on social media. And I would like to just ask folks, if if you wouldn't say what you're about to post to someone's face, <laughs> then don't write it. Yeah, to Amen. someone's face who's twice your size and twice just, your strength. Because <laughs> honestly, yeah. it is a lack of courage that they will post it on social media. It, it's, I hate to say that, but it's true. It's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. You don't have to look keyboard. someone in the eye. So. Or sleep on it. That's a great, you know, yeah. yeah. Don't a comment point. until the next day. Those yeah. are two great things. And what I've seen happen is this almost need to take sides on everything. Yeah. It doesn't right. matter which topic it is. Predator management or don't. Decoys, don't. This, don't. TSS, don't. I mean, it, in all of these things, none of those discussions, albeit fruitful, you, you always encourage people to engage. Yeah, you want dialogue. But, but geez, I mean, it, when, you, when I see these topics pop up and I see so many people arguing with each other, I step back and think, did that conversation on that thread benefit the wild turkey resource at mm-hmm. all? And the resounding right. answer is no. And more importantly, did it do anything to represent us positively as turkey hunters? And the answer is probably no. So if the collective result of being divisive is you don't help the resource and you undermine yourself, it doesn't seem to me that that's really that meaningful. That maybe no. we need to be more willing to be more introspective and recognize, not Laney, because he doesn't have any faults, but we all have faults. <laughs> He's deleting comments right now. Um, <laughs> you know, eat your words on social media and understand yeah. that back 20 years ago when you'd end up in the same room with each other, I mean, I watched some of the, the tenants of this world. I watched some of the people that drove turkey management for decades. I watched Larry Van Gilder and George Hurst Bill Porter, these people that were impactful to this this world that I now live in, and they had heated conversations, man to man, woman to woman, and they shook hands and they walked out of there understanding that every single one of them had the same objective. That's the key. Mm-hmm. And we, I think, in many ways, have lost sight of that, yep. that we all want the same thing, and if we don't recognize that how we interact with each other could be harmful rather than helpful, then we're losing sight of the forest for the trees. I mean, it's so easy, but it's so hard. But the resource and the truth, that's it. Yes. What's the truth? And so I will even go out and say some of us or some people in our hunting world they they'll act like they're on the side of the resource and they're kind of thumping their 
you know, their book about you're, you know, pointing fingers at people and you're not doing something in the best, but they're oh. actually on their own part. If you start like an argument or you sp- start a dispute that divides us, then you have done no good mm-hmm. to the resource mm-hmm. and you can't use the resource. You're only, you can only do that with your own personal agenda. Me, 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 I'm right. You're wrong. I'm right. You're wrong. And if that's what we get into, then we're not getting, we're actually, we're going down a, a worse road. Yeah, and I, so, I said this the other day, too. The The conversations are important. Yes. It, it's the way we have them that I that I, I have become increasingly frustrated with. And I said this the other day on a podcast. The conversation, I there's no question, we need to have difficult conversations with each other. Yes. We need to challenge ourselves. We need to challenge each other. We need to challenge agencies. We need to ask questions. We need to request information but how we conduct ourselves within our own ranks to me is something that's going to define us yeah and and we're not defining ourselves in some situations the way i i hope we should and i'm not i'm not saying i'm perfect but i i really have problems with that because at the end of the day if we're not benefiting the resource then we're missing the mark. Mm-hmm. And I think we all just need to keep that in our in the back of our psyche that, okay, is this actually helping the bird? And if the answer is no, then we need to take a step back. Yeah, we need to look at it hard. And think about our lives are just a blink. Think about it. I That's mean, right. people lose so sight of all that, and we're just so mired in our own way, our own right. time, our right now, like it's the only time in history. And so – we're going to be – we're charged with this period in history of something we love so much. And are we really – you know, when when your day is done someday, did it really matter you got to kill one more or you killed more than any someone else or you killed your limit first? Or or did we actually pass through this time and, and ensure the survival and success and plentifulness or whatever that word is Abundance. of something we really learn, love? Mm-hmm. These, you know – so, but it's hard. I know we're, I'm, I'm, you know, people are, people are, you know, turning this off when they're here, right now. but just, just think about it. When your day's done, what really mattered? Right. You know, cause you're not going to get a chance to then right now. And I always say, they ask me about, you know, having a vision in business and stuff. I said, well, or strategic thinking. And this is the same thing in, in our turkeys. It's like, just pretend like you, 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 you got your hands on a wall street journal from two years from now and, you know, two years coming up and act like you have that kind of information to make decisions. Cause we have to do that with our lives and with what we do based on the best information we have. So, and so that when we get down the road, we certainly don't want to have, we want to have the least amount of regrets. We certainly don't want to have regrets that are caused by our own selfishness. And I'm just saying this goes to everything in our life, but we need to apply it to the wild Turkey and our care for it. Yeah. If you love them Imagine that much, if you love hunting them that much, you got to learn to care for them that much. Write too. your own eulogy. It's amazing yeah. how philosophical we get. Well, it's because what we love. I mean, there's no difference because it's when you love something, you should care this much. I mean, how can people like him pour their life into this and then get their nose bloody by people constantly and have to walk right into the hornet's nest because they love what they do and they've got a conviction. And so that's what, we, you know, we're trying to honor them because they're they're trying to give us all the truth. And let's face it, we don't even have all the truth as hard as you've worked. No, never will. And I think the, for, the more he gets, the harder he works, the more, the more truths there are to uncover. But we are learning a lot in today's world because we're enduring the pain of a decline in our population. Well, well said, Mike. We, we, and look, oh we, we just uh, we just appreciate you. Let, let's just let's take a little break here, Mac. Have you got a trivia question for the good doctor? Oh, fun. We've got Mike. We've got. We always ask guests a trivia <laughs> question. I do. I do. I have a good one. Uh, so, Doctor Chamberlain, you're playing for Trevor three three three. So left this is a good podcast. Oh, triple so three. Trevor has left a review for okay. us, and we pulled his name off. So, if you answer the question correctly, he gets a prize. Okay. Now, if you miss the question, good gosh, so much. 
pressure. This is pressure. It, it really is. He might. You might want to do something for Trevor if you don't answer the question. Well, correctly. I'll just say cut. We'll get a you got to phone a friend option too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah so you yeah. can ask Toxie, who does not know this question. Okay. You can ask his opinion on okay. it as well. So go ahead, Mac. So the question is, which lion does the majority of hunting, the male or the female? Females. Boom, he's wow. quick. Ring the bell. Yeah, I mean, just, you can't I mean, stop the good would, doctor. Why would what were he you ask thinking? Me about lions? Yeah. <laughs> Females do all the dirty work. Yep. Yeah. The males just come in and that. scarp up the rewards. Yeah. Yep. Mac, I think it said like the line, the, the female does 90% of the honey. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. You These just those prides interact with each other. Those females work hard. Those males just they don't do anything. Lay around and try to secure breeding opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, we normally purposely try to make it difficult, but uh, it was hard to make one difficult for him. <laughs> yeah, you know, I started to go with Smokey and the Bandit, but I said no. No, no I would have crushed movie. you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched that movie about five hundred times. <laughs> I would have crushed you. My wife, I quote it. My wife's like, "Shut up, <laughs> shut up, Jackie Gleason." Yeah. It is one of my favorite uh, movies too. Yeah. yeah. So. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we why don't you just relax just a moment we, this is where we turn it over to dudley he doesn't ask dudley questions somebody's written in and we all usually learn something okay so uh this actually came uh from one of mac and neil and daniel's buddies his name's james morgan oh mm -hmm. the great gator man um, and i don't know if james knows but I think I dove hunted on your place about 25 or so years ago. And we want a duck hunt on your place this year. Yep. And if you got any doves. <laughs> he has the duck hunt. Yeah. Um, if he has any doves, we'd love to come do that. Yeah, we'll do that too. You're right. But, uh, all right, so James says, James. Dudley, uh, <laughs> what is a good spacing to grow a nice stand of oaks that will provide quality timber but also good for wildlife? I assume I need to space them closer together. Can you help me come up with a plan for this and how to manage it? My farms in the Mississippi Delta. So uh, anyway, James, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, and I, I went to forestry school and the majority of the teachings revolved around uh, what brings the, you know, the most important uh, to the timber in industry in Mississippi is loblolly pine. And there's been a lot of research and studies, um, but I was obsessed with hardwoods. I frankly got a bit tired of all the loblolly research, but uh, pines are easy. You know, you can plant them close together and they compete with each other. Uh, when they're close together, they prune upwards naturally. You know, the branches fall off and you have a clear log. And then at a certain time, you can go in and thin and then they grow close enough together to where they start pruning naturally. And, uh, you know, by the time they're 30 years old, you may have some uh, telephone poles mixed in there with your saw timber, or you could keep going and uh, just have bigger logs. But hardwoods are different. Um, and uh, when I used to frequent the Delta, I would drive through these fields that they had converted to CRP. And if you look closely, uh, they would be nothing but oaks, and they look like nothing but big bushes. Um, Oaks cannot compete well with each other. And so a lot of well-intentioned folks were planting nothing but oaks uh, 10 and 15 feet apart from each other. And I guess they assumed they could go in there and thin them, and then you would end up with this, you know, high-grade log. Um, and that's, that's wrong. Um, so I started obsessing uh, over some of these researchers one of them was brian lockhart uh, from the usda i think he ended up at arkansas emil gardner john hodges uh, dr ezel was doing some stuff on it too but uh, they were calling it the trainer tree concept um, and uh, that concept is you, you've got to be willing to be patient especially if you're waiting on acorns but uh, you plant your oaks um, and then you can plant competing you know like it's forest associates mixed in so uh, for james you're in the mississippi delta so you're planting bottomland species like cherry bark oak willow oak uh swamp chestnut oak nut, all. nut, nut alls all. uh, you get further Wooden north water, you can yeah. throw some pin in there but you also need green ash you need hickories you actually need the sweet gum that everybody thinks they hate Ooh. um 
helms. <laughs> uh, and what happens, uh, these researchers figured out that roughly around year 25, um, and they have different growth habits. Uh, there's X current and D current and other ones where, you know, some of them branch out more lower and have a pyramid shape. Well, the oaks try to grow straight up and they don't have a whole lot of leaf area up top. And then somehow at about year 25, uh, one of the things they can do is they can abrade the, the branch tips of these other species. Uh, like sweet gum is the most vulnerable and probably one of the best trainer trees. Uh, they can start abrading those leaves during windstorms. And then that red oak or white oak is able to just barely bypass it and start developing a canopy. But at that time, it has a long, straight, no taper log that has pruned up naturally. And so that's, uh, once it starts winning the battle, then it starts adding diameter and uh, you end up with a high grade log someday. So, uh, you know, so but what's there's. This, what's this facing then? Um, your oaks or your, your you know, generally it's going to be your oaks. They right. need to be about 25 feet that's apart. That's what I was talking So if you go out to Panther Swamp or Delta National or any of these government lands where the trees were either planted or let grow naturally, um, they're beautiful stands. They're high-grade logs. Yep. Um, but on the same note, there's some other species that you really don't want mixed in. You know, but I'm a big fan of diversity, so I don't right. mind them. Uh, cottonwoods, sycamores, uh, poplars can grow too fast and overtake them. Right. But uh, I don't really mind that. Yep. You've just got more diversity. Lanny, do you have a question? I do have a question. So would your recommendation um, differ for somebody that was looking for mass production versus timber production? Oh, for sure. Um, so and why don't we, you go into that a little bit? We do that time. all the time. I do that every day. Uh, people space them about 35 feet apart. So 25 if you're growing timber, 35 if you're wanting more right. mass, and more 35, lateral limbs, more acorn production. Yeah. So the 35 is you're getting rid of competition. That's right. And you take care of You get rid of keep them clean. Yeah, you're yep. almost I'll trying to produce a savanna-like That's right. mm -hmm. like deal. Um, Big canopy. Sometimes you can do the happy medium. You know, I'm, I'm all about a mosaic or a patchwork. So yep, some areas I may have savanna like that I mow around. Uh, and some areas I'm going to let grow up naturally or plant some oaks and let some of these wind-blown seed seeds, species, species like sweet mm -hmm. gum have those seeds land in and compete with them. But uh, it's really all about your goals. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I could talk for days. I obsessed over this for a couple of years. Yeah, you have. You know, More these guys were years. like my Mickey Mantle, yeah. you know. Thank you, Mr. So, uh, That's him. <laughs> yeah, anyway. There he is. Well, guy's good, Dudley. Yeah. Good, Dudley. Uh, if any, if y'all want to know anything else, just give me a holler at the office and we'll talk about it. There you go. Mr. Yeah. Hardwood. That's him. Yeah, that was good, Dudley. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mac, have you got a question for the good doctor? You, you're good there, okay. Mm. Look, this has been uh, – Dr. Chamberlain, we, you're one of our favorite guests, our favorite biologists. Uh, you're doing this work that we're just all fascinated by, and uh, we, we, just, we think about you a lot. Your name comes up around here. We've asked you, Daniel Hayes has asked you to be on the advisory board. Mm -hmm. We're starting this uh, deal called Gamekeeper Grants where the, the – a wild turkey stamp that was created and sold up. All those proceeds are, have been gathered up, and we're looking for places to uh, to to send that money so it helps wild turkey research. And we're asking, uh, Daniel has wanted to make sure it, we want you to be on that advisory board, Marcus Lashley, and, and you may know some other people that would be good at that. Yeah, so. I'm absolutely honored to do that. Be happy to help. Well, that that's Mossy Oaks, it's a big way Mossy Oaks giving back, and we're just kind of getting our feet underneath us with that. Yeah, just getting going. Yeah, it's going to be so a lot bigger than just more to that, come. but yes, absolutely. That's the first, and yep. uh, it's obviously created a big wave of positive uh, and brought people together. And yeah. so we just want to be sure we get the most for that. So it's all going back to turkeys. I can assure you that every single <laughs> penny. Yeah. yeah, it is. So well, thank you for being here. Oh, uh, it, here you all that you do. If there's uh if there's anything we can do for you, you just let us know. I think we have a meal. Yeah, you smell that? Mm -hmm. I, I do smell something. Mm. And I hope uh Sam wore a head net. So oh, well, I'm sure you did. Then yeah. we got some fresh yellowtail back there. Yellow yep. fin. Yellow fin. Yellow fin. Mm. That sounds good. I hope you like fish. Oh, I do. 
Yeah, I do. I think you like it. You, Fresh from the Gulf. Yeah. Don't even have to cook it. As I'm much pumped. time as you spend in Louisiana, you have to like kill it. Oh, I do. I uh, do. I haven't met many meals I didn't like. <laughs> yeah, you like It's wild I'm game. I, I'm in. I'm in. I'm, I'm, I'm in. Yeah, that's good. Okay, why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Mac Mac. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine and don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland. 